some years ago that an energetic young man uh, began working as a clerk in a hardware store. Now, like many of the old-time hardware stores, and we've probably been in some of those, the inventory included thousands of dollars worth of items that were either obsolete or the customers just weren't going to buy it very often. The young man was smart enough to know that no thriving business could carry such a large inventory and still show a healthy profit. So he proposed to have a sale to get rid of a bunch of the old and obsolete items. He went to the store owner and the store, eh, I'm not so sure about this, but finally he did agree. And they set up a table in the middle of the store and put all these items on it. And right at the front of the table or on the table, they posted a sign. All items, 10 cents. Well, guess what? At 10 cents an item, the sale was a great success. So the young man went to the store owner again, and he said, do you think we could have another sale? So they had a second sale. And the second sale was just as successful as the first one, which gave this young store clerk a great idea. He said, why don't we just open up a store where you're selling items for 5 cents and 10 cents? The owner told him, said, nah, that's never going to work. You're never going to find enough items that you can sell for five or ten cents. And the young man said, well, I could, I could run the store if you'll provide the capital uh, to be able to get that done. Well, the young man's boss sure wasn't enthusiastic about that, and he told him that that plan would never work. The young man was disappointed, and eventually he did go out on his own. He went out on his own with that idea, and he made a fortune selling things for five and ten cents. The man's name? F.W. Woolworth. F.W. Woolworth. Listen, it was years later uh, that his old boss lamented, lamented and he, he said, you know, as near as I can figure... Every word that I use to turn down Woolworth has cost me about a million dollars. That was a great opportunity that he had right there, and he passed it by, and he let it go, and he didn't capitalize on it. And that's a little bit what I want to speak on this morning is the opportunity of a lifetime. So if you have your Bibles, Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52, let's stand as we honor the reading of God's Word. Starting in verse 46, now they came to Jericho. As he went out of Jericho with his disciples, and a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And they warned him to be quiet, but he cried out, all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man saying, be of good cheer. Rise, he is calling for you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered him and said, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, I want to receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And he immediately received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for opportunities that you give us, Lord, to be a part of your kingdom, to work for your kingdom, uh, Lord, to furtherance your kingdom here on this earth. Lord, we thank you, we love you, and Lord, we just uh, want to give you honor and glory today, for it's in Jesus' name that we ask these things. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. As many of us know, God's mercies are new every single day. But you know what? So are the opportunities that he brings to you and I every day. Here in Mark 10, Jesus is about to provide Bartimaeus with a opportunity of a lifetime. Jesus was actually on his way to Jerusalem for the Passover. 
He was leaving Perea. He crossed the Jordan River and was now headed toward Jericho. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with the layout of the land there, but once you cross the Jordan River, uh, headed toward Jericho, that's about five, six, maybe seven miles at the most. And then once you exit, or once Jesus exited uh, Jericho, he headed on toward Jerusalem, which was to the southwest, and had to travel another 15, 16, or maybe 17 miles. Jericho was a very popular city back then, rebuilt by Herod the Great in the Judean wilderness. Now then, in Jericho, with as long, well, with many other cities, and especially along the way from the Jordan River to Jericho, and then on to Jerusalem, beggars were a common sight in most towns. Some were in town, some were along the road, they were just everywhere. Because most of the occupations at this period of time uh, required manual or physical labor, uh, anyone who had a crippling disease someone who was handicapped, someone who was disabled, uh, they were at a severe, severe disadvantage, and usually they were forced to beg. Even though, even though God's law commanded care for such needy people. In Jesus' day, many people believed that a person's blindness or their handicap or their disability was caused by sin either their own sin or the sin of their parents. Let me stop right there. I want to share with you, Jesus values everybody. Everybody, including those who are disabled, those who are handicapped, those who have a disability, no matter what it is. Folks, there are still some people in the world today who believe that people who are handicapped or have a disability today it's still a result of their sin or the sin of their parents. But you know what? I praise the Lord. Jesus doesn't see it that way. He does not see it that way. Jesus sees their impairments or their disabilities not as an indication of their sinfulness, but as a chance for His Father's power to be revealed. He even states that in John chapter 9, verse 3, when He says... It was neither that this man sinned, nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Bartimaeus had heard of a man called Jesus. And Jesus was known for healing the blind and many, many other miracles. We've all read the stories about Jesus and how he, had, he performed his first miracle of, of turning the water into wine. We read where he's made the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the lame to walk. He even had the power to raise the dead. He even walked on the water. I got to thinking about all the different miracles that we see in the New Testament and wondered, why are there so many miracles that we read about today? What was their purpose? And as I thought about that and I pondered, I only came up with one reason. The Lord shows us or has uh, us to read about the miracles in the New Testament for one basic reason. And that reason is simply to authenticate the messenger. God wants us to know that His Son is truly the Son of the living God. Jesus is exactly who He says that He is. The reason we see the miracles is because Jesus was doing things that we cannot do. And we're grateful for that Jesus said that He could raise the dead, and He did. Jesus said, even that we, that we know today, that He's coming again. He's, that's a promise of His. So you know what? We can take that to the bank. He is coming again. So we see as Bartimaeus, though, was sitting alongside the road, that um, this was, as Jesus was approaching, this was a passing opportunity for him. It was the opportunity of a lifetime for Bartimaeus. And it would be the only time it would be the only time that Bartimaeus uh, would uh, have the opportunity to see and meet Jesus, and he wanted to take full advantage 
of that encounter. As Jesus passed by, he was going to do all that he could do to meet and have an encounter with Jesus. Now, that reminds me, you talk about passing opportunities. And uh, I want to share one opportunity, and that was uh, several years ago. I say several. It's been a few years ago that Linda came to church on a Wednesday night. And she was all smiles, and you could tell she was all lit up. And she actually took the time to give us a testimony of why she was smiling and, and the, the shining that was going on around her. And she shared with us that at lunchtime that day, she and her granddaughter, Ansley, had lunch right over here at Mellow, Mellow Mushroom Pizza. You know, I'm thinking, what's so special about going to Mellow Mushroom Pizza? But anyway, they were sitting there. They were about to finish up their lunch. And Anthony told Linda, said, it's her. It's her. It really is her. And, and if I'd have been there, I'm thinking, who's her? I don't know who her is. But she looked around and she said, you know who she saw? Drew Barrymore. Drew Barrymore, and I thought, wow. I asked Linda, I said, well, did you get an autograph? Did you, were you able to talk to her? And she did. But Linda realized that this was a passing opportunity, that she could meet someone that, that was famous, someone from Hollywood. And so she got up and she went over to introduce herself, I suppose, talked to her for a few minutes and said she was just as sweet as she could be. And uh, it was a great encounter. But, you know, I, for Linda, that was a passing opportunity. That was the opportunity of a lifetime for her. Linda, she, has uh, Drew Barrymore ever been back to Gainesville Do you, that you know of? Have you met her for a second time? See, it was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. It would never pass. Uh, that way, she'd never have that opportunity again. So as I thought about Linda and I thought about uh, Bartimaeus sitting on the side of the road, I couldn't help but think, is there anything that you and I can do today that will help us to sharpen our ability or to hone our skills uh, to identify opportunities that God brings our way? Well, we know that we can always read and study how God has worked in the lives of ordinary people in the Bible, in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Think about Moses. Think about Moses with his speech problem, how he would, how God was able to use him and moved a whole nation, the whole nation of Israel he brought up out of the lands of Egypt going toward uh, the promised land. Now think about Noah, how he used Noah to build the ark. And I said, you know, before the flood came, well, you know, I don't think Noah had a clue as to what the flood was all about, but he was faithful. He was obedient. He did what God wanted him to do. Think about Paul in the New Testament and how God used him to share the gospel with people. Uh, it was really amazing. So we can read and study how people, how God used people uh, uh, in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Another thing we can do is look around and see where God's working at. Uh, Henry Blackaby has told us that determine where God is working and go and meet him there. Go and meet him there. And how amazing that is when we pray and we read and we study the Bible. We go to where God is working and we become a part of his work. See, God will work through the Holy Spirit to make you sensitive to his voice. And once we learn, once we learn how it is that God operates, then we must choose to walk in faith just like Bartimaeus did. Just like Bartimaeus did. So we see that for Bartimaeus, this was a passing opportunity. It wasn't going to happen again. Secondly, we see that he positioned himself strategically. He said he had heard that Jesus was coming this way as he passed through Jericho. So he sat on the main road, the main road that goes in and out of Jericho. Well, you know what? It wouldn't have done him any good 
to go sit up by the Sea of Galilee expecting to see Jesus because Jesus wasn't coming that way. That's like you and I going to the parade that's on Green Street and go out here to Athens Highway and sit on Athens Highway expecting to see a parade. It just wasn't going to happen. Listen, by listening, though, you got to remember, Bartimaeus was blind. By listening, Bartimaeus was keenly aware, aware of who was passing by. Who was passing by in and out of the uh, city, the conversations that were going on, what were people talking about. And we see in studies, in studies, scientists have shown that when one sense is lost, the corresponding brain region can be recruited to do other tasks. Now, researchers have learned this primarily by studying people who have lost their sight. And brain imaging has found that blind subjects can also locate sounds using both the auditory cortex and the occipital load, which is the brain's visual processing center. Now, if I were to stand here, I'm going to ask Donna. I know you can't see me, but do you know who's speaking this morning? Who's speaking? See, I, didn't, I don't know if anybody told you who was preaching this morning, but I've called Donna on the phone before, and she picks up the phone. I know she can't read the caller ID, but just by speaking, she knew who I was. She knew exactly who I was. So the other senses are used and are magnified. The Bible tells us that uh, when Bartimaeus heard Jesus coming, that he started to get excited. The crowds were growing larger and larger. Now, the noise was getting more and more loud. You know, and it said... The Bible tells us that it was a great multitude. Now, I can't define for you how much a great multitude is, but it was a great number of people, I would imagine, in the thousands. And you can imagine people coming out of town, thousands of people, Bartimaeus is sitting by the, the side of the road, the noise is getting greater, and it's hard to hear. And Bartimaeus starts pleading. He starts pleading with Jesus. There's a sense of urgency on his part. Today is like making a 911 call. You call 911, you know, and you don't hear somebody on the other end. They're talking and saying, I have an emergency. Can you send the ambulance as soon as possible? Now, when you call 911, you know what? You're like Bartimaeus. It's a sense of urgency. It's a sense of desperation. I've got to get in contact with this man called Jesus because he's the only one. He's the only one that can do something about my blindness. And he called out and he called out and he knew that Jesus was the only one. It's just like when we dial that phone for 911. We need an ambulance. We need some paramedics to help us with this desperate situation. So he began pleading with Jesus. Can you imagine what it's like trying to call or plead with somebody over 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 10,000 people and the noise that they're making, you can't hardly hear. Bartimaeus cried out over and over and over again, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Crying out over the sounds of all the large crowds. But you know what? He didn't stop calling. He didn't stop calling until he got a hold of Jesus. Now, this is on a personal note. My dad has taught um, me and my brother over the years a lot of things. But one thing that he instilled in us is you don't ever quit at anything. You need to follow it through until you get the desired results. You know, and Bartimaeus kept hollering and hollering, and he wasn't going to stop. I can just see the people walking by and kicking old Bartimaeus, that old dirty, filthy old man. Just be quiet. He's not going to pay any attention to you. Told him to be quiet and give up, but he didn't quit. My dad gave me this poem, and it was when I was a kid, and I imagine probably everybody has heard it. 
Uh, but I'm going to read it anyway because I, I think it pertains to, to Bartimaeus right here and what he's, what he's doing, and he's not giving up. The poem is simply called Don't Quit, and it goes like this. When things go wrong, as they sometimes will, when the road you're trudging seems all uphill, when funds are low and the debts are high, and you want to smile, but you have to sigh, when care is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must, but don't you quit. Life is queer with its twists and turns, as every one of us sometimes learns, and many a failure turns about when he might have won had he stuck it out. Don't give up, though the pace seems slow. You may succeed with another blow. Often the goal is nearer than it seems to a faint and faltering man. Often the struggler has given up when he might have captured the victor's cup. And he learned too late when the night slipped down how close he was to that golden crown. Success is failure turned inside out the silver tint of the clouds of doubt. And you never can tell how close you are. It may be near when it seems afar. So stick to the fight when your hardest hit is when things seem worst that you must not quit. Bartimaeus was persistent. He kept hollering. He kept hollering. He kept calling out for Jesus, and it finally paid off. And it got the attention of Jesus. In the midst of all of that going on, Jesus stopped. Of all the people that was, it was a distinct voice that Jesus picked up that he could hear Bartimaeus calling his name. So they said, call, call the blind man saying to him, take courage, stand up. He is calling for you. Jesus had stopped. I'll tell you a true story when we get right in the middle of this about another time. And I remember Renda and myself and our son had gone to St. Louis, I guess, to see my mom. And there's always something to do up there. But Kyle had never been to a ball game up there, never been to a Cardinal ball game. Let's put it that way. So we decided, well, we'll just go to the ball game. And uh, ended up, I said, well, I don't know what kind of tickets they got. And we ended up getting, got down there and found out where the only tickets they really had was the tickets that were in the left field bleachers. I said, you know, that's fine. We'll just sit in the bleachers. And we got, got into the ballpark and kind of uh, was watching what was going on. Players were warming up. And if you're f familiar with the ball game, the ball players, what they do, they warm up. Some will run between in the outfield from the left field line, maybe to center field, and back and forth and back and forth. They try to get loose and warm up. And I got to noticing, I said, I didn't know who the pitcher was for that day, but he ended up, um, got to watch and run back and forth. Lo and behold, one of the pitchers that was exercising and getting loosened up was none other than Chris Carpenter. And you know, people just kind of, when you're warming up like that, they kind of they holler at you and they're trying to heckle you and everything. And 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 you if if you're one of those athletes, you need to just you need they learn to block that out. You really don't hear a lot of that that's going on. So he Chris he was still going back and forth and back and forth. And people were still jabbering at him. He wasn't paying any attention to it. So I thought, well, I said it'd be nice if he knew that we were here. I'm trying to think of something to say to get his attention because nobody else was getting his attention. That for sure. So I thought about it. I just hollered out. How about those red elephants? And boy, you know what? He stopped. He stopped right there. And he turned around and he looked at us and I never forget the guy that was biased. He was looking at me like, Man, what you been smoking now? You, you talking about red elephants. I don't see any red elephants. I said, <laughs> didn't have a clue what the red elephants were. And the old guy beside him, we kind of looked like he gave me one of those Cheech and Chong looks and thought, man, I don't see no red elephants, but I'd like to. You know, I'd, I'd like to see some red elephants. <laughs> So anyway, Chris came over and very cordially talked to us just over the wall for a few minutes, and he tossed a ball up that we caught and gave it to Kyle, and that was it. But think about it. 
of all the people that were heckling him today, that were hollering at him, there was one distinct voice that stopped him. And it was because he could relate to what I was telling him. So same way with Bartimaeus. He kept hollering when he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and he responded. Now, Jesus' reply to this poor man's plea for mercy is extremely crucial. I don't want you to miss this. It demonstrates that Jesus is willing to listen to our cries for help no matter what condition that we are in. No matter what condition. He will answer us. He hears our prayers. He loves us. He's concerned for us. He wants to help us. He wants to assist us along the way. And finally, Bartimaeus was able to bring his petitions to Jesus. He came to Jesus, and Jesus in verse 51 simply says, What do you want me to do for you? I wonder how many times Jesus has come to you and to me and ask that very same question. What is it that you want me to do for you? Just like Bartimaeus, Jesus wants us to tell him about what we need. What we need. He wants to sp us to speak with him because he loves us. And he desires a personal relationship with him, with us. In light of Bartimaeus' opportunity I believe we need to realize that the Lord creates opportunities for you and for me to fulfill His plan and the purposes for our lives. So we have a responsibility when those opportunities come to look back and say, how has the Lord um, provided for me before? What has He done for me in the past? And recognize that He's not going to give us opportunities without providing the needs to fulfill to fulfill Him through the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to make a decision to follow the voice of the Lord, and we need to be persistent without giving up. We need to be a people who take advantage of every opportunity that God brings our way. Jesus' walk through Jericho was not just any opportunity for Bartimaeus. It was his only chance. It was the only chance that he would have. It was the very last time that the Lord would pass through that way, would walk that way to Jerusalem before his crucifixion. For us today, as children of God, there are promising new roads for us to take every single day. But we have to decide, do we believe the Lord? Are we going to believe Him? Do we want to explore what He has to offer us? Are we willing to take advantage of the unique and exciting opportunities that God has, plans, has planned for us? I believe we can. I promise that if you will receive and if you'll capitalize on the opportunities that God brings to you, you're not going to be disappointed. You're not going to be disappointed.